I'm awake, oh, amazed how you all can be so awake while we're all so tired from this morning still. One of the last questions before lunch this morning was, how is it that Italians are so poor and work so hard if Berlusconi can have so many girlfriends? <laughs> so I, I, just imagine how your world was back in 1945. S suppose you were alive in 1945 and somebody had told you about all of the new technology that had been inv would be invented between then and now. What if you were told about all the computers, the internet, the communications and television, the jet air travel, the super trains, the increased glass mileage, the plastics, the medical breakthroughs, you would have imagined that we all would be living in a life of leisure society by this time. And in fact, all of this was celebrated as a post-industrial economy. And indeed, productivity has grown so much that under all of the textbook models, the idea was that rising productivity would be passed on to labor in the form of lower prices, so wages would go further, or higher wages. The whole idea was who was to get the fruits of all of this productivity. And in all the textbooks, there was what was called Say's Law. Workers had to be able to buy the results of what they produced. And this was a circular flow, the circular flow between producers and consumers. And this idea goes all the way back to the French physiocrats, just before the French Revolution, who created economics and account keeping. The founder of physiocracy, Francois Quenet, was a medical doctor and a surgeon and he based the idea of national income accounting on the circular flow within the body between producers and consumers. So the idea was that all of this increased production had to be increased product consumption. So the idea was, as a variant of functional finance, that production creates its own market for consumption by paying workers who then buy the products they produce. So the question is, why hasn't this occurred? With all of this productivity since the end of World War II, and especially since 1980, why aren't you all rich and enjoying a leisure economy? In world, after World War II, mainly the men worked and the women were at home. Since 1945, women have been forced into the labor force for what are called two-job families, and now they're three-job families. If you pro project labor, uh, pr uh, labor participation rates, by the year 2020, every woman will have to work 18 hours a day and her children will have to begin working at the age three to sustain their standard of living. If you were going to have children, you'd better send them to work at the age of three or you will go broke. Well, obviously, what has happened is that what was applauded as the post-industrial economy has become the f financialized economy. The reason you are working so much harder than you were before and is because you're paying off your debts. 
you're not buying the goods and services that you produce, you're paying the banker. Because you can only maintain your consumption standards and keep on spending what you produce if you borrow to do it. That is the Euro plan for you. That is how the Euro plan is replacing industrial capitalism with finance capitalism. Wages and living standards have not riven, risen. All of the gains have been siphoned off by finance. And it's not, when they call for austerity, it is not the fat that they're cutting. The fat is the financial sector. It's the bone. It's the industrial sector. So the post-industrial economy means deindustrialization. It means unemployment for you. And unemployment means lower wages. In all of the economics textbooks, in Economics 101, as you saw on the door, there are supply and demand curves. The idea is that the higher the unemployment rate, the higher the employment rate, the more you have to pay labor to drive it into the labor force. So the government officials and the bankers read these textbooks and they say, ah, okay, so the less employment, the more wages go down and the more we earn. And so we want unemployment in order to maximize the power of our wealth over labor. A hundred and fifty years ago, this was called the Reserve Army of the Unemployed. You need unemployment to keep labor down. So despite the fact that you have productivity rising since World War II, the real economy and your wages have become an S-curve tapering off. What has grown in keeping with productivity is the magic of compound interest. This growth in compound interest has absorbed all of the increase in productivity and it's accrued to the 1%, not to the 99%. So when you understand this, you have to understand how to answer the questions that were raised before lunch today. The, uh, the key is, look at how today's economy is different from what occurred in 1945, and you'll see that we're at the end of a long cycle. Back in 1945, in every country, the private sector was relatively free of debt. There was very little for consumers to buy in the war, and companies had little reason to invest except for the government. So most families had very little debt, but they had a lot of savings. And today, the economy is the reverse. The savings have been run down, and the economy is in debt. It's important to know how this occurs, to know how to stop the process that has taken place for the last 70 years. The reason is not only financial, it's been fiscal. The taxes have been shifted off banks and their customers, mainly real estate and monopolies, on to labor. In the, 19, in the United States, for instance, in the 1930s, 70% of all state and local tax revenues came from real estate, from the property tax. Today, only one-sixth comes from that. States and cities have been convinced to lower the property tax burden and to take an income tax and a sales tax 
and the worst, most anti-labor tax of all, your value-added tax. Your value-added tax is intruding onto the market and shrinking it and preventing you from buying the goods that you produce. And they're taking your value-added tax and they're giving it to the bankers who control your governments and control your politicians. And when even your politicians can't sell out, they then say, we need a technocrat to impose even more taxes, to tax you labor more, to give more to the banks, to bail them out, because the plan they have for you doesn't work, and it leaves somebody bankrupt, and it's not going to be the banks, because they're who give us our jobs. So, So in the United States, for instance, uh, one problem is that uh, in 1982, uh, Alan Greenspan, a free marketer, uh, headed a Social Security Commission and said, Social Security should not be a public service. It should be a user fee. We have to make the private sector, the users, the laborers, pay for it. And they not only have to pay for it, they have to pay five times as much as they get to the banks because the, my clients, the bankers, we have overhead. The saver in America, the pensions were paid by bankers saving the money in advance, creating a huge budget surplus, giving the surplus to the government so that the government would cut taxes on real estate cut taxes on finance, cut taxes on the rich, cut them in half, cut capital gains taxes, and then say, now we're broke, we have to increase the social security tax further because the workers have not paid enough to social security to give it enough money to fight the war in Iraq, to fight the war in Iran, to fight the war in Afghanistan, and most of all, to fight the class war against labor. So the banks have become part and parcel of this f finance, insurance, and real estate sector that I spoke about. They, uh, uh, we have what is called pension fund uh, capitalism in America, uh, where the employees are supposed to become capitalist in miniature by employee stock ownership programs. In America, one uh, half of the employee stock ownership programs have gone bankrupt by being grabbed by the corporate employers, like I described Sam Zell of the Chicago Tribune today. Banks lend money to corporate raiders and to management buyouts to buy the company, to pledge all of the earnings as interest, to steal the employee pension fans and essentially become a process of looting. So you have the way to get fortunes today to be essentially by looting. They've given a Nobel Prize for the writer uh, who described this, but it basically is what I talked about earlier today, what Balzac said, behind every great fortune is a great theft Today, the economy is being based on theft, and that's called free enterprise. That's called social democracy. That's called socialism. But it's not socialism, and it's not social democracy, as people were told 100 years ago. It is a travesty of social democracy, a travesty of socialism, and we're living in an Orwellian world where the politicians' names for their parties are the exact opposite. No party calls themselves fascist today. No party calls themselves anti-labor. They call themselves social democracy. But I get the idea that you realize that it's not social democracy at all. Uh, in America, in order to get a job, students now, instead of getting free education or low-priced education, have to take out loans that put them in debt to uh, 
create a family, you have to take a lifetime of 30-year mortgages in debt to pay a mortgage. You have to take out an auto loan to be able to buy an automobile to get to work. And then you have to take on credit card debt. When you pay this debt, and the result is debt deflation, that's why the workers do not have enough money to buy what they produce. That's why the bankers have ended up with the increase in productivity. Now, I've spoken in generalities and principles so far, but it's good to give an example of the country that is held out to you is how you want to be. If Italy succeeds, what country should you be? You're told Latvia. Latvia is where the neoliberals had a completely free hand, as they did in Russia, as to what kind of an economy they were going to create. And they created a neoliberal paradise. Angela Merkel, Sarkozy, this is what we want for Europe. What they did in Latvia is tax, have an employment tax of 59%, 59% for labor. They have a real estate tax of 1%. When I went there, I asked how they got the 1%. They based it on the most recent real estate appraisal they had, which is in 1917, before the Russian Revolution. So you can imagine that what happened was that with real estate tax so low and labor tax so high, there was almost no employment but there was a real estate bubble. People have blamed the real estate interests for making a ton of money and getting rich off absentee ownerships. But the principle of real estate speculation in America is that rent is for paying interest. Whatever the tax collector gives up and relinquishes in taxes is available to be paid to the banks as interest. So the banks end up with all the rent that used to accrue to the landed aristocracies of Europe. So bankers have become the new aristocracy. And it is as hard as there is from feudalism. So what you're seeing today is the same economic grab that gave birth to European feudalism. And that grab is backed by the finance sector on behalf of its clients, the real estate sector, the monopolies, uh, and the legal sector. Uh, the result is that one third of Latvia's population between the age of 20 and 35 either has emigrated from the country or is planning to emigrate. The population has shrunken by 15% under neoliberalism. Lifespans are shortening. Marriage rates are falling off. Who can marry and buy a house when your wages are taxed at 59% and you have to take on a debt now, the, uh, uh, in Latvia uh, a year ago, I met with the bank insurance agencies, and they saw that this is a problem. And they told the banks, you cannot collect from the value of real estate that you're lending against. Their solution was not to have the government tax real estate more so that there's less available to pay the creditor. Their solution was to go to the banks and say, when somebody comes to borrow a mortgage, you have to have their parents sign, their children sign, their aunts and their uncles sign, so that when we foreclose, we can not only foreclose on you, we can foreclose on the whole family. And we can make the whole family emigrate or be reduced to poverty. The same thing has happened to Iceland. Iceland, which is much worse. People have spoken to Iceland as if it were a model of what should be. It was only a model of how the populations should vote against the banks. But Iceland, even more than Latvia, 
is a banker's paradise and such a hell for workers that, as I said, 10% of the population, 30,000 Icelanders, have emigrated to uh, Norway, and other country, Icelanders are told uh, uh, to move elsewhere. What Iceland has is what is planned as a model for you. The index that they owe to the bank of the debt is linked to the foreign exchange and the consumer price index. So since uh, the credit crash of 2008, from the crooked uh, Icelandic banks that were looted, the, uh, you, you, if you took out a uh, thousand uh, euro uh, debt, you now owe 180 euros on it against property that has fallen from the equivalent of 100 euros down to 40 euros. So you're in negative equity, you're personally liable, your family is liable, and the debt has gone up. Now, Paolo asked me earlier to talk about the vulture banks. When the crooked banks of Iceland went under, and they've just in the last few weeks begun to arrest the crooks, when the banks went under, the government took them over, and at European advice, saying no matter what, you have to pay the, pay the uh, bankers, you have to punish labor, uh, but you have to sell the banks to vulture investors. The vulture investors bought the banks at 10, cent, 10 euros on the dollar, or 10 cents on the dollar. Under the constitution of Iceland, they were not allowed to increase the debts by indexing, but they did. Under the bank agreement, their promise was if you write down, if you buy a bank at 10 cents on the dollar, you have to write down its debts by 90%. The banks promised to do this. They have not done it. The Icelandic uh, people uh, and economists have demanded that the government apply this. The social democratic government says, we don't have to do what the people said. The people voted us into power, and we work for the banks, not for the people. Social democracy means rule by the bankers. It means rule by a small number of families in England, in Holland, in Germany. The social democratic government says, we're part of Europe. We are not part of Iceland. We are not your democracy. We are the democracy of the European and German and French bankers and English bankers who've supported and put us in power. So when many of you asked before lunch, what do we do in a situation? We want to do something about it. We want to be active. What can you do when the political system on both ends of the spectrum are so corrupt? To me, what is uh, amazing is how the social democratic parties that were supposed to begin on the left side of the political spectrum have moved to the right wing of the political spectrum. Now, I've known most of the social democratic leaders of America and the world since I was a little boy. In the 1960s, I was told that uh, the travel and hotel expenses of every member of the Socialist International, the Second International, of which uh, Dmitry Papandreou of Greece was the president, was paid for by the CIA. I watched the Socialist Party in America come to support the Vietnam War, and to ban all criticism of the Vietnam War in its uh, youth magazine. So it lost 90% of its members. The theory was that you could not have Marxism until you freed the world from Stalinism. And to do that, the Social Democratic Party of America, the Socialist Party, joined the Cold War effort and became the supporters of uh, the Johnson administration and the Vietnam War. Politics was turned upside down by the triangulation of socialism and uh, 
uh, Stalinism, and the, the ability of the United States to convince the Social Democrats of Europe that if it bribed them and paid them enough, they would be willing to support the banks as a bulwark against communism and uh, Stalinism. And so the Social Democrats sold out with great personal benefit to themselves and be really believed that the way to finance industry uh, to oppose the industrial exploitation was to support financial exploitation. They imagined that the banks would lead the world into economic progress, not in just the opposite direction of what the progressive era did. So the result is that the social democratic parties of Iceland, of Latvia, of Scandinavia, and of uh, other European countries now believe that the way to uh, employ labor is by austerity. If you can only lower your wages by 30%, stop having children and emigrate, there will be an equilibrium. This is the exact opposite of what industrial capitalism uh, proposed, and yet it's the dynamic that you have today. The alternatives, and I'm just going to hint them for what I will be talking about in the next, uh, not all taxes are bad. Taxes on labor add to the cost of labor. Of course, you want to untax labor, untax consumers, get rid of the value-added tax. But there's one kind of tax that's good, and that's the tax on, on unearned income, on land rent and monopoly rent. The more you tax that you shift the tax system onto the land and property, the lower housing prices are, and the less you have to tax labor by income tax, the less there is for the banks to collect an in interest. The bankers are against government because they want all of the taxes that are now paid to the government to be paid to themselves as interest. I'll expand that in the later versions tomorrow morning. Thank you.